Hi everyone, I'm Bill Kelly. Anyone who passes through Harbor Grace can't help but notice an old rusting hulk lying just offshore. Standing tall, perfectly upright, almost completely out of the water. It's almost as though the skipper deliberately ran her aground, gave her full throttle until she brought up solid. Well, where did she come from? How did she get there? Reporter Red Sharon thought these questions had all the makings of a fascinating story, and he was right. Here's Reg with the story of the SS Kyle, one of Newfoundland's most celebrated coastal freighters. Oh, she's not much to look at now. Not much more than a pile of scrap and memories, really. But what history she sailed through. This is the National News Bulletin, a summary of the day's news. The news of final victory in Europe came to Toronto a few minutes ago. New hope has arisen in the hearts of our people. I should like to direct my first words today to the people of this new Canadian province of Newfoundland. For close to 50 years, the steamship Kyle sailed through all those sounds as she made her way along the Newfoundland coast and down to Labrador. For thousands of people, she was their highway. She carried fishermen to the fishing grounds, doctors to the sick, and families back home. So how is it that she wound up here, grounded in Harbor Grace? Well, that's a long story. It was 1913, and a bicycle built for two was all the rage in the dance halls. St. John's was a bustling cosmopolitan centre when on August 26th, the Reed Newfoundland Company announced in the evening telegram that a new steamship, the SS Kyle, was about to make her maiden voyage to the Labrador. <laughs> This was the era of the steamship, coal burners to carry freight and passengers, with engines powerful enough to break through most of the ice in the Labrador Straits. And the Kyle was all that. When the roads ended, there she was, taking on passengers all along the coast for the voyage to Labrador. Mahogany and teak in her staterooms, brass and copper everywhere. As steamships go, she was considered one of the finest. She was the queen of the coastal vessels. We were always up around the decks, you know, and yeah. when, when she was, when it was calm, my sister and I, and we'd go and look in, it was real, it was just real fantasy land to us, you know. Brass shining and that was really glittering. And I can see the tables laid now with their snowy white cloths and uh, the stewards with their white coats and uh, their collars, I remember, was just like glass. They were so glassy. To Greta Huzzy, the Kyle was her second home. Every summer, she sailed to Labrador with her family. Greta was a very young girl when she made her first trip in 1924. Down on the coast, there was nothing more welcome than the old Kyle. You'd look up this way, or down, whichever you might prefer, look south, I'll say, and um, you'd see a black cloud arising. That's the only way you knew she was around. Sometimes we'd be mistaken. From her stack. But that's right. Then everyone would be all excited. Boats leaving, going out in skulls, as the saying goes. A fisherman could get to his fishing grounds down on the Labrador for about $4 one way. Come May, they were lining up to go. They were four and 500, mostly women and youngsters. Almost hard to believe. Well, there were five or six of us youngsters, and then my mother, you know, and my father, he was there with another man, so it was only, only two against five or six, eh? This made up a lot of children yeah. and women. They packed them on like sardines in the spring. George Forward knows he was one of them. I always liked boats, you know. I she was a nice shape, old thing. Better shape than they make them today. The shape of the steam and the stern and the hull, you know. 
They call the hall. The shape of her was one of the things that attracted George to the old Kyle, so much so that he decided to carve her lines in wood, lovingly recreating the ship that carried him to the fish so many times. The first captain I remember was, I remember was Captain John Clark from Brigus. Yeah. All they had was a pocket watch. And the log they gave up behind. Look at the watch then. So many miles run down. You're going in the harbor, make the square then, go in slower down. No where we was at. And then when they got the radar, certainly. Yeah. But he knew what he was up to. Indeed he did. Yeah. I've seen putties. Floor down, put his ear over the bridge. He'd call it the crowd on deck, and now he'd tell him, no man to speak. He'd listen to the roar to sea from the land, in the fog. Start her up again, go ahead again, next thing you see land. I never ever struck her either. <gasps> never ever hit, uh, no. hit, hit bottom? No, no I don't, know, don't remember ever seeing her ashore. The first trips in the spring had been, it was important. That's when we pick up the fishermen. Captain Harold Tucker. He was the last captain of the Kyle while she was still a passenger ship. One trip, not in my time, but I understand they sold 600 tickets on one trip. Well, that was nearly all one way, I would think. Yeah. On their way up to fish? On the way up to fish, yes. I do it sometime in 32 hours. Yeah. There's no ice, more time in two weeks. Yeah. Come at us on that and go in again, go out and come in again. Couldn't get across straits. We had that for days. Now what sort of what a sort of method did you have to get through the ice when you when you were trying to get up from, say, St. Anthony? Well, there's no method, only when when she could move we'd we'd go. And if she if the ice got too heavy or too packed too close, well you just have to sit it wait out. We didn't mind the ice one bit. Just love to hear the house around. For the, Wasn't for the, it was rough. That's right. And we weren't going to get seasick. I remember this one time Pat came down, he says, Come up on deck, he said, and see an iceberg. Oh, it was just huge and long, and the top of it was as flat as the table. It was really, really a large thing. Did you ever get worried that she might hit an iceberg? No. But he had an ice scrunching along, you know. And they were a happy bunch, ice or no ice. The trips were almost legendary, and some of the times were well documented too, and recited in verse. Tall are the tales that fishermen tell when summer's work is done. Of fish they caught, of birds they've shot, of crazy risks they've run. But never did a fisherman tell a tale so tall be a half a mile, as Grandpa Walcott told that night in the smoke room on the coil. With backy smoke from 20 pipes, the atmosphere was blue. There was many a have another boy, and don't mind if I do. When somebody suggested that each in turn should spin a yarn about some circumstance he'd personally been in. Then tales were told of gun barrels bent to shoot around the cliff of men thawed out and brought to life that had been frozen stiff, of bark pots carried off by flies, of pathways chopped through fog, of Uncle Bill, who barefoot kicked the knots from a 12-inch log. But it wasn't always fun and games. For a while there, there was danger. Everywhere was being heard the cry, join up, join up. During the 30s and 40s, how about the threat of Nazi attack? It was real enough. They were out there trying to stop the troops from sailing to Britain or to break the supply lines. Any U-boats or fear of German U-boats? Yeah, we didn't realize it, but there was one or two sunk in the straits when we were, I know, just before we came up or just afterwards. But uh, they painted it gray then. 
completely grey, all of no white on her at all, and uh, they weren't even allowed to light a cigarette on deck. But we didn't realise the danger, you know, just, we thought it was just a precaution, but we had afterwards, they were, they were down there. Of course, oh yes, the danger was, was very, very real. Remember the SS Caribou and her gallant crew. Torpedoed in the middle of the night, the Caribou was lost to the Germans in the Cabot Strait during the Second World War. The Kyle replaced her for a while, taking passengers to the mainland. But fortunately, she escaped attack. The ice, however, she couldn't escape. By now, she was over 40 years old and starting to show her age. When we returned, the beginning of the end for the steamship Kyle. Hunt. For many of the iron steam giants, it was the only place left to go, carving their way through the ice to pick up sealers and pelts. By now, it was 1960, and the Kyle wasn't needed anymore as a passenger ship. But the Earl brothers of Carboneer thought she was just the ship for the front. With her reinforced hull, they thought she was the perfect match for the ice in the Straits. And for a while, she was. But there was trouble. Yes, Fred Earl. They had to get the crew on the ice at the time, too. They were up in Straits of Belle Isle. And this huge iceberg was the ground up there. And the uh, ice was running. And the car was in this running ice. And they ran down towards it. But uh, as luck should have it or whatever, fate had it. She didn't get stay, hang on the iceberg, but her side was crushed, which made her leak. But they did get out there, so they finished the voyage. And, Got a trip of seals out of it. It's true she made it back from the ice that year, but she would never sail again. Well, the fact that was that she was a coal-burning steamship, because she was a, a slave shop, you know, when it came to a coal burner. You had to pass every bit of coal with a pan shovel. That's how she was, the boilers were, were fed. And uh, then she was damaged, and uh, the damage was in excess of what she was what we had her value at. She had a lot, of, a lot of damage there from that ice experience. <clears throat> so we, uh, we moored her up in Harbor Grace, and we had some people interested. We thought we'd make a, we'd go into a, a restaurant sort of a business, you know, and then put her probably put her on a cloud sound somewhere like that. But anyhow, there was a bad storm there. If I remember correctly, I believe it was from February one. And a hell of a snowstorm and a hurricane of wind. So she parted one of her anchors, if not two. And she drove into where she is there now. And uh, while well, we went up and had a look at her, that's all we could do. So there she sat. It wasn't long before people started collecting mementos a piece of brass here, some wood paneling, or maybe even a boom. They stripped her clean. A crowd of vandals got aboard of her, and they started to swipe uh, brass and copper and materials like that out of her and sell it to scrap dealers. Whatever was worth anything. That's right. And Jesus was all the worth, worth good money. There's, you know, huge copper pipes for carrying steam and, and the, all our brass fittings and all that was all terrific. You know, everything was, it was all there, you know. It's, we, we never scrapped her. Anyhow, uh, the, the police caught some, took them to court, and the magistrate told them they were bad boys. So I said, the hell with this. I wasn't going to fool around with, wondering what's going on with the coil and what I'd be like that. So uh, there was a scrap dealer in St. John's, and I sold her as was to him. And he went aboard her last summer, and he, he scrapped a lot of materials out of her. He, he took the blades out of her, and he took all the rest of the copper and brass. And he also uh, took some of the woodwork out of her. There was some, a lot of mahogany and teak. And I think some of the teak decking was used for patio in St. John's. Not just patios. This table came from the smoke room of the Kyle. It's used now here in the Carboneer General Hospital in their medical library. At least some of the Kyle got some use. 
The rest of it was sold to the provincial government in 1972 for about $4,000. They had some ideas about turning her into a marine museum. That, of course, didn't happen, and not much more was heard about the Kyle until 1982, when she made the national news. If you've been looking for a very used ship, the Newfoundland government would love to sell you this one. The Kyle had become the provincial government's responsibility, but the government said she was little more than an eyesore and tried to sell her. But not even national advertising worked. Nobody wanted her. So there she sits. What do you think when you drive out through Harbour Grace and see her there now? Well, I, I think that, that uh, someone could have made one hell of a lot of money out of her, if they, even where she is now. If they'd have painted her up and, and made her look like something and what have you like that. And, uh, you know, she is, is, is it, now she looks like a derelict. But if she was, had to be kept up, she'd have looked like, you know. Like a million dollars. Like a million bucks, you know, and then uh, two times or, or someone else could have made a hell of a lot of money out of a film of her because there's one easy pile of pictures taken of that Kyle. She was a very important boat back in those oh, days. Oh, she though. was, yeah. Yeah. The send this here up or like that. The way it is now. Yeah. yeah. She sort of moved land a long while. Oh, my dear. I don't know. Well, it's too bad. I'd like to see her painted up like she was. I mean, there's people, although we were so glad to get off her, there's people that pay money now to get back on her just once more, including me. Greta Hussey has been down by the old Kyle and Harbor Grace hundreds of times since the steamship was driven aground in that storm, reliving her memories. But never has she ventured on board for a close-up look at what's become of the Kyle. That is, until now. Okay, come on, man. Come on now. Welcome aboard the Kyle. Oh, oh my. Get in there? Yeah. Well, watch your foot. Wasn't it? Well, well, there you go. Come on around. All right. We got you. Oh my. You're not hooked up there. There you go. Oh my. Well, well, well. Come on this way. Now we'll go down the back here first. Well, Excuse me. Find your step now. Memories are so strong. I don't know what I'm thinking. You don't just spend year in and year out in a place like that and not have any memories. This was home for you? <laughs> for about a week, every year. For 17 years? Mm-hmm. There were beds all along there. And how many of you were sleeping in this area? Um, two, three, four, five. There was about 15, I suppose, 15 beds, I guess, along there. There's about five in length. Is it there along there or six? Yeah. That's the porthole there that I got the steward to open up when the measles broke out, just to give us a breath of fresh air. A lot of memories down here. There was beds in and out here, too, see? You were just like sardines in a can. You just had a room to move along here. What do you see when you look down there? Oh, I look back across the years. I can see my father and the crew and a lot of others down there stretched on their, their boxes and twined at card traps, freight, barrels. Then find a flat spot on top of some flat cargo. spot, try to smoothen it out as well as you could and uh, straighten your bed. And then they'd lie. Mm -hmm. You didn't have a bed to yourself, you just lay wherever the quilted cover, right? Yeah. So many memories around every corner. In through every window.
what time and neglect and age can do for anything. It would have been nice to have had her painted off, even if you couldn't go aboard of her, but there would have been a lot of money wasted at things that have been less worth, I think, yeah. Well, now, hold on a minute. It seems the people of Harbor Grace aren't ready to give up on the old Kyle just yet. For years, they've been trying to come up with some money somewhere to fix her up a little bit. And now, it looks like they've had some success. The federal government has come up with a few thousand dollars to look at the possibility of maybe putting a trailer park in the area here, maybe even a floating dock out around the Kyle. A little bit of paint fix her up a bit. You can't turn the clock back. She'll never be as she once was. But maybe the queen of steamships can shine again, if just a little. <laughs>